Um, hello, and welcome to all of you to this event of University Connect program. I'm Dr. Elora Trivedi from School of Historical Studies. Welcome to all our esteemed guests on the dais, including Honorable Vice Chancellor, Madam. Um, um, we now have a plenary session on role of youth in making India a $5 trillion economy. Uh, before we proceed to that, um, I once again um, welcome uh, Mr. Saurya Dhawal, Director, India Foundation. Before I request Sir to um, uh, share his address, I would briefly like to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Saurya Dhawal. Um, Saurya Dhawalji is a Managing Director at the Torch Investment, wherein he leads the global investment business out of Singapore. He has nearly 25 years of international investment banking experience, during which time he has worked for over a decade in London and New York with leverage finance business of GE Capital and the investment banking division of Morgan Stanley. An alumnus of the prestigious Hindu College DU, Mr. Doval is a qualified chartered accountant from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, ICAI. And he also holds an MBA from London Business School and both school, University of Chicago. He is a recipient of the Udyogratna Award in 2012 for his contribution to the growth of Indian power sector. Mr. Dhoval is also a director of India Foundation, a think tank based in New Delhi with strong nationalistic credentials. Mr. Dhoval started India Foundation in 2009 on his return from London and has been closely associated with the growth of the foundation in the last decade. Mr. Dhoval was the Eisenhower Fellow from India for the year 2015. He was selected by the government of Japan for their invitation program for ministers, strategic exchange on practical level, STEP, for the year 2022-23, where he learned about the culture, economy, and policy making in Japan. Sir, please. Thank you very much. Uh, morning, otherwise, an energy. Pastor Unji, distinguished faculty, guests, and my lovely young friends. For me, it's quite surreal to be in Alam, ancient place of land. I don't know what I must have. I don't know what I must have observed to be here. I, I was trying to uh, put my finger to it, but it must be some good work of my past birth, can't find any in this birth that, you know, I am here today in Nalanda, modern day Nalanda, and speaking to scholars. You know, for us in India, to be able to come to a place like Nalanda is a matter of both pride and honor. So I, for this, I'd like to thank the RIS, the Vice Chancellor of Nalanda University, and all of you to have given me the chance. G20's India presidency, as the Ambassador Saab just spoke, is an important event because it is India's desire and India's destiny to be the Vishwa Guru in the years to come. And I think that as in India has been a Vishwa Guru, and Nalanda has played a role in India being that Vishwa Guru, and it is my hope and belief that in the years to come, this university, the modern version of Nalanda, will make its seminal contribution in taking India once again to its place in the Committee of Nations as a wish. I was given the topic to speak to you today on the role of youth in making India a $5 trillion economy. If the chair permits me, I'd like to alter that a little bit to increase the canvas of my talk today in making India a $30 trillion. And the reason I say this, I will just explain. Because in the next 25 years, as India becomes, uh, uh, you know, completes 100 years of its independence, 
it is pretty much established now that India will be a $30 trillion economy. The only discussion or the only effort that we will be making was that whether we will be a $30 trillion economy or a $50 trillion economy. So I think what I'd like to frame my today's talk is that what is the role the youth can do in making India a $30 trillion economy? And then I'll be happy to take any questions uh, if there is time permits and if you all have any. So let me give you the trajectory of the Indian economy first before I give you the future. When the, English, when the United Kingdom left us as an independent nation, that is when India, after a thousand years of slavery, of which the last 250 years were under British, the size of our economy was $30 billion. Somewhere around late 1997-98, we increased it from $30 billion to $300 billion. In, so about after 50 years of our independence, by the time we hit 60 years of our independence in 2007, we became a $1 trillion economy. Now, this was an important milestone because even today in this world, out of the 200 countries, there are only 16 countries that have an economy the size of $1 trillion. It was at 2007 that India became a 16 country, and hence India's increased role in the G20 that we defined as, as the top 20 countries, that India became a, a trillion dollar economy. So think of the journey. It took us about 60 years from independence to become a $1 trillion economy in 2007. In 2014, in seven years from there, we doubled that number from $1 trillion to $2 trillion. And from 2014 to 2019, which is five years later, we again increased it to $3 trillion. We are currently in 2023. Our economy size, as Madam said, is somewhere around 3.5 trillion. By the end of this decade, we will be a $6 trillion economy. So what has taken us 75 years from 1947 to 2023, it's about 2019, $3 trillion. In the next 10 years, we will double it to $6 trillion. So the question of $5 trillion actually is irrelevant. Because what we are looking at, that by the time, and depending upon what growth rate you take, by the time we hit 2047, which is 25 years or about from now, we will be a $30 trillion economy. What this means is that when, the, when we became independent, from the time we became independent to the time we reached 100 years of our independence, our GDP would have grown up, grown by 1,000 times. In the human history, including China, nobody would have delivered this kind of a miracle, where you take a country from 1,000 times increase in its GDP. And our per capita income today is $2,000 in 2023, Based on these numbers, by 2047, our per capita income will be $20,000. That is 10 times of this thing. And we will be having, a, uh, in today's OECD grow, uh, the GDP per capita income is about $12,000. So for a developed country, you have to have a per capita income of $12,000. As I said, by 2047, our per capita income will be $20,000. And we will be delivering this economic growth to 1.5 billion people, which is 20% of the world's humanity. And in the kind of country India is, that India's this economic miracle of $30 billion will not just be confined to India. At the minimum, if not to the entire world, at least the countries around us, this, the, 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 the nations around us in, in Southeast Asia and South Asia, Will, which is another billion people will benefit from this development. So about 40% of humanity will benefit from this miracle that India will deliver to the world in the next 25 years. Today, India has, is 65% of the world's, uh, sorry, 65% of India's population is under the age of 30. 40% of that population is under the age group of between 18 to 35. That is about 600 million people are there. The beneficiaries, the direct beneficiaries and the direct participants 
in this miracle will be the youth. These will be the people who will not only benefit from these next 25 years of India's economic growth, but when India hits its 100 years of independence, they will be at the helm of the affairs of this country. And therefore, they must understand that what is their role in making India a $30 trillion economy? What is the contribution that the country and their forefathers expect from them as India reaches this global benchmark? And before I get into the role, let me assure all of you in the audience that there is no doubt in the world that India will hit this number. It is pure mathematics. As I said, whether we hit $30 trillion or we hit $50 trillion will obviously depend whether we grow at 5% or we grow at 8%. But we are crossing a $30 trillion mark, and that is why, as the Ambassador said, India is today at the high table of the global world, uh, in the world because every country knows that it will have to deal in the next 25 years with India of this size. And I'm purely talking about its economic might. I'm not even dwelling into its uh, political strategic uh, might. So. As far as I think that the, what is the role of the youth in this? Everybody will have a role in this, you know, as I said, but in this miracle. But the role of the youth particularly is important. And there are three principal things that I think that the youth will have to do to be able to be uh, important participants in this, uh, in this journey. The first is that they have to change the mindset of this. 1,000 years of slavery of this country, of this country has unfortunately altered its minds. Our colonization ended 75 years ago, but the effects of that are still being suffered by our population. And we expect that the youth will be able to change that because the youth that is leading this country now, including, and I identify this as a very important benchmark, that the first time in the history of independent India, the current prime minister of this country was the, is the first prime minister who was not born a slave. Now, the problem with, uh, with, with being born slaves is that you lose your confidence. You lose your belief. So the youth has to first change the mindset of changing a mindset from a defeatist and self-doubting mindset that this country, uh, the, 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 of, of a colonized country, to making that of a confident and assured mindset. A mindset that believes that, yes, we are going to do it, we can do it, and we will do it. And what it means in economic terms for us, it means that our pivot will shift from growth to regulation, uh, from, from, to growth from, away from regulation. That is, we will now be thinking of not of growing wealth, not protecting it from losing it. You see, after we became independent, this was a very hard-earned independence. It was an independence earned after a thousand years. So for the first 75 years, the people who led this country were afraid. We were afraid of losing what we had. So we went in for a great amount of regulation. We tried to con protect whatever we had. We tried to protect our borders. We tried to protect our wealth, whatever little we had. And we tried to build our capabilities. But what that did was that we became very protectionist and very regulatory in the way. As the Prime Minister now keeps saying, the time has come. We have achieved our objectives. In 75 years, I'm not belittling the fact that this was important, very important. We had to consolidate our gains. We have, by and large, consolidated game. And we are now changing the pivot on how we will look at the world over the next 25, 50 years. We will shift our gears from being regulatory towards growth. So in, in economic terms, it means, for example, to give you a small example, we will not be any longer job seekers. We want to create a new round of job creators. We want people to be people to create businesses, to create wealth, so that they give jobs, not seek jobs from somebody else. And hence, you will see that we have to change the way we have to end this. And our youth has to come out of this mindset. Our youth has to believe that they can be job creators and not just unlike their parents who always felt and continue to be, maybe continue to put pressures on them of uh, looking at government jobs, of thinking about you know, uh, protecting the, uh, the little that they have as against uh, growing the, the way. And what is the, what is the, what is the, what is the prime moving, mover behind uh, 
to taking seeking this protection only to regulate only to regulate those countrymen of ours who are anyway more disadvantaged than us to exploit the limited resources that the country had and, and be able to assert them to our personal benefit as against saying let us create wealth and prosperity let us create a thing for everybody for building up our disadvantaged people out and taking and that can only happen through a, a growth mindset so i think that the first thing as i said we have to change our mindset of the youth india over the years and i i have grown up in part of that india over the years we blamed every problem of ours to one single reason we can't do it because we are poor we can't have this because we are poor we are poor we are and the point is we are not poor any more we are standing at a 3 trillion dollar economy we are going to a 30 trillion dollar body nobody nobody can claim that india we have a resource problem and if anybody we have no resource problem in uh, having the best army in the world the best technologies in the world the best universities in the world and even little bit that we had in the past in the in the future uh, as i said the eighth wonder of the world the power of momentum will take uh, even if everybody goes to sleep more and more wealth is coming into this country so india is not going to have a wealth problem india is not going to have a so this excuse the youth will have to drop of saying we were poor and therefore we could not do it so now time has come for us to be audacious to think big to want to win to be world class to be better than not just good enough as madam said but to be world beating and be good in everything that we do and in doing so to realize those aspirations the country will stand by you because the country will be able to empower you with every resource that you need whether it is capital whether it is technology whether it is education whether it is healthcare it is it is taking time but it is rapidly catching up world class infrastructure so we will be able but we need to but we can still not deliver it and the prime minister the honorable prime minister keeps on saying it we still cannot deliver it unless we have the audacity to be think big our parents you know indians for the, we were very you know and i lived overseas for many years we were very submissive we were afraid we were modest we always kept saying we are modest because you know but now the time has come for us to shed our modesty to shed shed our audacity and you can see that you're already seeing that in the way the indian cricket team plays on the cricket field today right there is a little there is a sense of arrogance and i'm not saying it in a negative sense but india needs that arrogance now in, and the youth of india needs that arrogance it needs the arrogance that yes we have come to win you see that in bollywood the way we do it right now we are producing movies that are hitting the oscars that are and in five just wait and watch in next 5 to 10 years just today the whole cricket world is controlled by us in 5 to 10 years the whole bollywood will also be controlled the whole entertainment india world will be controlled by us so we and then these are just two simple examples i gave it to you but we have to bring it on all aspects of our national life it is in the aspect of technology in the aspect of education in the aspect of research we have to become a a, a winning country we have to learn to uh, uh, you know we are uh, you know we have to learn to be and 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 be and a great inspiration that we have in this is our honorable prime minister just listen to what he says actually much of his talk is all about invoking our citizens to start believing in themselves you know in start and we have to take this message in each on everything that we do every aspect of our society to our towns to our villages uh, so that we can show this and even this whole idea i mean i would i would i would you know maybe the ambassador can elaborate sir but you know look at the way we are celebrating g20 you know we have taking a g20 to every small nook and corner of this country somebody would have said what is the need of this g20 is just a normal event that countries do we could have had a secretariat a few meetings in delhi and this would have been over like everybody's presidency some bureaucrats ministers would have come and met but the prime minister understands that this message of g20 going to our villages is to make that young boy who is studying in that school village in the interiors of meghalaya or in the you know state of the karnataka or tamil nadu or come jammu and kashmir realize that india's time has come it is to share with them to bring in them that confidence that yes india is today heading the 20 most developed countries in the world and recently somebody was asking me that you know where when will we will in some this uh, when i was in japan the rodi india want to be part of g7 we and we, uh, my answer was why would we want to be part of g7 g7 is irrelevant 
If you don't have India and China in the G7, what is the point? You can keep doing your G7 meetings, they don't count as G20, or we'll create our own G7. We'll only create, because now the time has come to rewrite the rules. This is not the India that was a broken, $30 billion, thousand years of slavery, you know, you know, famine country that you were talking to. Even during that time, when in 47 we were defeated, then only, then also, we charted our own course. We started our non-aligned movement. We tried to do something of our own. So you are dealing with that India of today, which is looking at 30 trillion. So the youth have to believe. And in this, again, I will just go back to saying one thing that you have to know, that as much as they, uh, 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 you know, as we become rich, as we become powerful, we will be hurt with respect. And the role of the youth is that don't be complacent about it. I'm not saying this from a, from a, from a, that, you know, just because we are going to be this, we have to be complacent or arrogant. What I'm trying to say is that before you win, you have to believe in yourself. As somebody, I was at a lecture yesterday, somebody rightly said, you know, a, a winning country, a winning individual, a winning family, a winning community, a winning society needs three things. It needs Atma Vishwas. You must believe in yourself. It needs Atma Samman. We must respect ourselves. Our ancestors were not monkeys. The Industrial Revolution did not change the altar of the world. We knew the distance between this place from here, we knew the, 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 the distance between the earth and the sun, even then. So we, we, we lost political battle. We were, uh, we were, we were colonized for a thousand years. We understand that. But we must have Atma Samman, and then we must have Atma Chin. We must think how and what we have to do to be able to change the way we, we operate. So, you know, just being chaltaho attitude, yeah, you know, we'll, we have to work hard to becoming world class. Anyway, this guy can go on and on, but you know, so the so second thing I would like to add is the second thing that we have to think is that one of the biggest challenges that we have in achieving our objective is that we have to move the share of manufacturing in our GDP as we move from $3 trillion to $30 trillion. We are currently, our, we are not, we don't make anything in the world. Our manufacturing is only 15% of our GDP. It should have been, for a healthy country, it should be around 25% of GDP. So if you take India's economy today at $6 trillion, our GDP, our manufacturing GDP is 450 billion. So much so for what I was saying in the world point, India rarely produces anything today which is world class. And therefore, we are not able to export anything to the world, which, is, which the world needs. We have to move this from, from 450 billion to about $6 trillion in the next 25 years. Now, this is a big challenge also for us because we, if we don't make anything in, in India, which is world class, then we have one million Indians joining the workforce every month. We will, this will become, this is 12 million Indians coming to the workforce. These are 12 million youth joining the country. Where will we give them jobs? We can't give them government jobs. There is no government to give job. Government, you know, they, they, they you know, we give 40, 50,000 jobs in the government a year. We are talking about 40, 12 million people coming into the workforce. So we have the youth of this country, as I said earlier, has to start thinking: How are we going to make in India? This "make in India" is just not a political slogan. It's not such a thing that you know. It's and it is our biggest challenge to crack, because we today don't have. The, tech, the, the wherewithal. You know, I was in Japan. You know, they're a small country. They beat us hands down in manufacturing. You know, you know. You go to Germany. You know, they, they beat us hands down. Their products are world class. They produce the products. We buy them. Now, how do we shift this change? This will be our biggest challenge, and this is where the youth of this country has to uh, apply for their own sake. Otherwise, this growth will lead to no prosperity and, uh, and, 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 and growth for their families and for themselves. The youth of this country has to think how, and in this I also include the infrastructure part, because India is going to invest about a trillion dollars on infrastructure. We are building huge roads, sports. You see them everywhere. You go across India. Over the next 25 years, India will massively scale up its infrastructure. You look at this own university, which is a product of this infrastructure, and therefore, for uh, Indians to, uh, for Indian youth, the 
the big challenge will be solve this conundrum of move, making India a manufacturing hub in the world. What we could have done in services, we have by and large done. So we, there is lim limits to where we can go with services. We have to find way to crack manufacturing. And I think the answers to that will have to come when we start thinking from a very different mindset than what we are currently doing. And, and we are still struggling with this. So this is a problem that is there for the youth to solve for their sake and for the country's sake. The third thing that I think the, root, the youth will play a role in changing, uh, in making India a $30 trillion economy is the, uh, is the creation and absorption of technology. Tech, tech, tech. Anybody who controls tech controls the future. Any co country that controls technology controls the future. India has a very solid base to build and compete in this race. We have a huge technical talent. We have huge institutions that produce technical talent. We today already provide technology to the rest of the world. But we now have to change the way we are going to use this technology and change the way we are going to think about uh, creating technologies for the future. You know, somebody, uh, ma ma Madam said that, you know, we have um, thousands of startups a year. We today have 115 unicorns with a valuation over a billion dollars. And this valuation of their combined valuations and of this, of these 115 unicorns, these 115 young boys and girls born and brought up in lower to middle class Indian families. They did not come from any entitlement and background. Their 350 billion is more, their net worth this is more than the combined wealth of Ambani and Adani. So now think of it. If 115 young Indians could have created this wealth, in the last few years, with no access to capital, technology, with no entitlement, and today, the 115 valuation of 350 billion means they're richer than these big businessmen. So if, that, if you multiply that 115 to only 10 times, imagine the kind of wealth that India could create. So these startups, this ability to take risks, the ability to create technologies, the ability to thing is now for us to take, is now for the youth to take. If 115 could do it, if these thousands could do it, we have to increase this number to tens of thousands and improve our, and improve our chances of, 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 of going. We are already among the world's 100 tech startups. Six out of them belong to India. I'd like to see in the next five, 10 years, that number goes up to 20, 30, 40. And, you know, and then this, this, is, this is where, of course, our, another challenge comes is the question, and this is something for our educationists and for our teachers to think, is that the faculty that, you know, we still are not at the cutting edge of fundamental research. We made the vaccine to the world. We produced the vaccine, but we gave away most of the money of that to Oxford because they found, the, they did the research on COVID. -19. And therefore, whatever we, the royalty that went away, should have actually gone to fund our universities. If we had discovered that, we would have been funding with that money, that money would have come to our universities to, to do. Okay, this time we did it, we, but we still made some money because we produce. We are now being able to produce this kind of infrastructure. You know, any one of us who grew up in, I went to some of your rooms yesterday, I saw that you have world-class infrastructure, you have air conditioners, you have, you know, this decent campuses, etc. Ask any one of us who grew into universities in the 90s and the 80s, you know, this was not the kind of universities that India had. So we today are giving you all the, 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 the infrastructure, the resources, the capital, as I said, to um, think, but we have to do produce world-class products, world-class universities, and world-class research if India's youth is only going to be able to uh, compete in the in the times to come and and change the way that uh, that that you know India as as a, as a nation uh, uh, sits at hundred years of independence. I'd like to now finally dwell to one point before I conclude that you know. We talk about India being a Vishwa Guru. And uh, when we talk about being a Vishwa Guru, uh, it's not just being a 30, 50 billion dollar economy. That, as I said, we will get there. We also don't have to worry about our geopolitical might. You know, we know we have a, we are a nuclear power you know, from the Straits of Yemen to the Straits of Malacca. You know, we have a blue water navy. So, you know, India's counts, India's voice counts, India's voice 
will be heard. But the question will be, what will India say? We will be heard. Earlier they did not hear our ancestors because they said, you were poor, you don't come to the high table. But now we have arrived. And we are going to come there with a bank with, in, the, in the next 10, 5 years, is a bigger bank. Today we have the presidency, we'll have more in the future. The question that is, that are we going to be able to give an alternative economic model, an alternative socio-political model to the world? And I come here because I'm speaking at Nalanda, therefore I thought that it is worth mentioning this one. You know, today's wealth creation, if you look at about 250 years of wealth creation post the Industrial Revolution, whether it was in the world of manufacturing, with the United Kingdom and Europe after the Industrial Revolution, or in the post-Second World War after the United States and Japan with their technologies, has led to a world which is totally broken. The first Industrial Revolution led to a world of colonization, man exploiting man. It led to two big wars. The next uh, growth of world economic uh, growth left, is leading to such huge inequalities. Today, 2% of the world's population controls 80% of the global wealth in the West. You know, to, they are telling me that yesterday, a few days ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation people had come to tell me, they had said they, out of $8 billion they spend on uh, welfare, they are spending $2.5 billion in education in the United States. So I said, what? These United needs uh, education system needs charity. They said, yes, it needs charity because their education system for 80% of the people is so broken that they, they, they cannot do with the state funding. So it's only the top 5% or top 2% that get all the top universities and create all the wealth. Average American is not even able to go. Bill Gates charity has to sustain that. So what kind of a world is the world created by following this model of wealth creation? As I said, I, and look at Europe's own change. Even this whole climate change problem that we are talking about. This is a product or outcome of the last 250 years of uh, industrialization. So this is, this is a big problem. If we just follow the same model, as I said, we will also become rich. But what kind of a world do we want to become rich in? What kind of a world do we want to be there? And what, what, if we are also going to say the same things that they said, it's going to lead to no different outcomes. I was in Japan a couple of weeks ago. They have dropped Article 9. They are arming themselves once again. You know, they are now saying that uh, in two years, three years, they will be the world's third largest defense spenders. You know, in Europe, they have passed a law that 2% of their defense budgets after this Ukraine will go back into building military and technical capabilities. So this time, the war will even be bigger. Everybody has got better technologies, better weapons, bigger wealth. So even if you become rich in a, and you are the world's wealthiest country in a world which is broken and where, you know, you, you know what, does, what, does, what does wealth mean on the streets of Kiev today or in the, on the things of Ukraine? What does it mean? So the question is not just about us becoming a 30 to 50 trillion dollar economy, it's also becoming us giving an alternative role, uh, model to the world of how we should be thinking. And I appeal, appeal to the, the youth in this room that it is, this is what you must aspire. This is what India gave to the world for thousands of years. This is what Nalanda gave to the world for thousands of years. That intellectual leadership that, we, as we talked about, one world, one family, one future, that is what is expected, I think, from the new and modern day Nalanda. And I'm sure that the students, the faculty, all those who of you who are here will think about these issues and will think about that as India becomes a $30 trillion economy, does India become a $30 trillion economy with one more big player adding to the problems, or does India become a country where, or a leader uh, giving a beacon, to, uh, you know, is a beacon to humanity about a prosperous, safe world for us and for our future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And um, uh, I request all of you to give a warm applause to sir. Sir really gave a really visionary lecture for all of our, um, all the members who are present here. He talked about changing mindset, decolonizing our mindset, so that we can look at future of India to the growth. Um, so now uh, we have questions. Uh, we, we welcome questions from all of you um, uh, in uh, relevant issues. 
And I ask the volunteers also to uh, circulate the microphone so that they can be Sir, please be seated. Um. Yes, we have a student. Please introduce yourself. The question. Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. My name is Visarg Mishra. I am pursuing MBA uh, in second semester. My question is to you, sir. So when we talk about growth in terms of GDP, it majorly involves uh, consumption. So how will we imbibe the sustainable practices in ourselves? Because when we talk about sustainability, we talk about circular economy to reduce, reuse the principles of all these things. It is like counter uh, productive when we talk about economics. So how will we address the question of sustainability? This weird dichotomy of sustainability and economics. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, Mike. Hello. Yeah. Acha. No, actually, you know what? Uh, now, I don't think it is, it is contradictory. If you think of it from a very conventional model, if you think of it from a, you know, if you go back to the classic industrial revolution model, that, you know, yes, there are contradictions. How will we make a GDP which is growing and which is uh, not just based on consumption, but as I said about manufacturing, if you're going to more manufacture, then how will it happen that, you know, um, uh, uh, the world's climate change, how will it be sustainable? As I said, now I'll give you a different paradigm. Think of it differently. Think of it like this. You know, I was talking to you about startups, and you were talking about startups, and you're talking about hundred startups in India today, which are unicorns. Think about India, and you think that if 20% of the world's population lives in India, and you started, people started creating startups that solved not the world's problem. You don't have to compete with a Facebook or a Google, but start solving the problems of Indians, right? Somebody has a water problem, somebody will have a problem of, 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 uh, of living in a, you know, in a half housing problem. You could actually, you are dealing with 20% of the world's population. You could create 100 more unicorns, 1,000 more unicorns. It's your economics, right? Here is the people. These people's income is growing by consumption by just the moment from $3 trillion to $30 trillion. You don't have to be an economist for this. Just think of it. You are now producing solutions to them. And if these solutions have to be sustainable, because so that otherwise, as I said, then you have to create businesses that will be sustainable. So I, do, I think as long as we think about economic growth and development only from the, uh, from the, from the, from the past, uh, from the, the Western model, which was about exploitation of nature, which was about exploitation of the natural resources, we end up in a world which, is, which makes it unsustainable. But I think if we start thinking about it from um, a, a different model. I mean, India is already meeting its, uh, its all its sustainable requirement, you know, uh, requ things. 30, we are already doing it. And we are growing at 6, 7%. Change the way even more. And I think this is where the youth need to come. This is where you all need to think, not from a, from a, from, look at, uh, from here only, they were telling me that if you go to the old Nalanda University, there they used to make, uh, they use, in those times, they used bricks. And the bricks were excavated from here. And they created, with those things, ponds and waters, bodies, to, to build those buildings, and they cannot still fathom how long, long the campus was. If they could have done it thousands of years ago, and in a sustainable way, I don't think that, I think it's this whole mindset where we have that, oh, no, no, inter, you know, the, the, the only, there is only the one way of doing it, which was the, you know, the way Manchester's factories were built. That is the only way we can do manufacturing. Already doing it here. So I think sustainability and development and growth are not contradictory at all. Um, 